they enrich uranium or they have reprocessed plutonium, they have the potential and the capacity to make the bomb, but they don't do it because it doesn't serve their security interests. Iran wants to reach that point so that it could use it as a deterrent, it could use it as a way of projecting power and gaining credibility among Arab you know, masses against Israel. And yet, in my opinion, Iran is not going to cross the red line because they don't want war. Talk about, I would like to like now it's a good segment to go to this um, nuclear energy and nuclear bomb that uh, uh, Iran's been accused of making the nuclear bomb. But can you talk about that in respect to um, Israel and you know Israel having nuclear bomb and Israel's acting as a uh, police of the region? Right. Uh, it's let me say a few words because it's really ironic and fascinating, particularly for Iranians. Uh, when Khomeini came to power, he was opposed to the nuclear industry. He was, as I explained yesterday, also categorically opposed to the agreement between Iran and Iraq, the Algiers. Abbas Khalatbari, the foreign minister under the Shah, he was prosecuted in the spring of 1979, and there were two charges against him, and they referred to it as treason. One was he had signed the agreement with Germany about the nuclear facilities in Boucher. The second one, he had signed the agreement with Saddam Hussein, the Al Jazeera. And if you go back, I have the paper I can f forward. The, the executed body of uh, uh, Abbas Khalatbari is printed on the first page of Etelaat, and the headline says, reads the charges against him which is so mind-boggling. And now, both of those ideas. They think Algiers agreement is wonderful, and it has to be put, put respected and protected, and they think it is the national right of Iran to have. So in 1984, they started it. If Iran is going to challenge Israel, in per, at least propagandistically, in a pursuit of its own ambition in the region, uh, it has to claim that it has the potential to face up to Israel's well-known, well-established military superiority. And that military superiority of Israel definitely includes the fact that Israel is the only country in the region possessing nuclear weapons. So in this case, so Iran, Iran and Israel are so far away that if there is a war between them, it's not the land war that is important, it is the air war. And Syria, Israel has the fifth largest and one of the most effective air force in the world. You know. So Iran, in order to show that it has the potential, it has the capacity to confront this power, wants to project the image that they are capable of making nuclear weapons, but at the same time they have signed the non-proliferation treaty and they claim to this day that they have no intention of making the bomb. However, what Iran is doing is very much like what probably at least 20 other secretaries to the non-proliferation treaty have done, that they, they enrich uranium or they have reprocessed plutonium, they have the potential and the capacity to make the bomb but they don't do it because it doesn't serve their security interests. Iran wants to reach that point so that it could use it as a deterrent, it could use it as a way of projecting power and gaining credibility among Arab you know, masses against Israel. And yet, in my opinion, Iran is not going to cross the red line because they don't want war. Iran knows that in any war between Iran or the United States or Iran and Israel could expand into unintended, unpredictable consequences and inevitably the Iranian people and the Iranian political will lose. And even Americans, they really don't want to invade Iran because it could lead to 
the, the kind of consequences that will not serve American economic and security interests in the region and the Europeans categorically opposed to China and Russia. So Iran is playing this game that I don't think Iran will make, a, make the bomb in the foreseeable future. And I don't think Iran will make peace with the United States in the foreseeable future. They will be suspended because it serves the regional ambition and it also serves the fact that that was really the principal point I was trying to make yesterday, that Iran, first and foremost, Iran's uh, uh, opposition to modern social culture values with respect to the Iran, and they have associated that with the United, with Western world in general, which is true, and the United States in particular. So the, the idea that Iran will have normal relationship with Western Europe and uh, in the United States is not in the card, and yet Iran is ready because they are Machiavellian calculating decision makers. They will give the United States implicitly the kind of understanding, verifiable understanding, that Iran is not crossing the red line. In my opinion, this is the direction we are seeing Iran moving. Let me ask you two more questions. Um, thank you very much for sharing all your time. Sure. Okay, so the anti-imperialist movement in the United States always brags about I'm sorry, the anti-imperialist movement in, in, in the United States is always attaches itself to outsiders. North Korea will be one of them, Iran is one of them. So how do you see this uh, aspect of social political understanding uh, abroad, uh, outside of Iran, especially in the United States, that somebody else is doing the fight for them to be an anti-imperialist, anti-United States? I think it's a it's a fanatical and absurd perspective that they look at the world and say uh, the principal enemy of the working class is the capitalist system. And the capitalist system is led by the United States of America. Therefore, if we want to liberate the working class, to liberate the masses, to create justice, heaven on earth. First and foremost, we have to destroy the capitalist system and the leader of the capitalist system at the top of the heart. This I'm just summarizing the ideological you know, perspective that therefore any voice that attacks the capitalist system or the top of the pyramid is by definition a supporter, an ally, and we should support it. This is an utter absurdity that in Iran, the enemy of the working class in Iran is the regime. You cannot have a labor union. You cannot have minimum wage. The enemy of human freedom, the enemy of gender equality is the regime. Oh, they ignore all that because this is regrettably exactly the position that the two day party and the regrettably, the majority, the Fadayin, at least the... Say who to the party was. The Communist Party of Iran. The Communist Party of Iran had a great deal of upward because they represented, in fact, a very small uh, percentage of even middle-class, urban-based uh, intelligentsia and some middle class elements and yet because of the organization, because of the resources, because of the experience, they had disproportionate impact on the political environment of post-revolutionary period. Because many other people, they didn't have the experience, they didn't have the resources, but here and then with the assistance, remember the Cold War was still on, when the Iranian Revolution happened, the principal function of the Soviet Union and purpose of the Soviet Union was to bring Iran to the... To, and the two-day party was performing that function. So they said, based again on the same absurd perspective toward the world, that the real enemy is capitalism and the real internal enemy is national bourgeoisie and therefore we should destroy the national bourgeoisie. Religion is the opiate of the people. Religion is super structural. Religion is epiphenomenal. We know how to deal with it. And that we shouldn't dismiss that perspective completely because as a student, I did all my undergraduate and graduate work in the United States. During this entire eight, nine years, we never read a single book 
or even an article about religion as a political force. I'm talking about 1960s. There were two perspectives with respect to religion. One was the leftist perspective, which dismissed religion as a passing phenomenon. Religion is on its way out. And the other one was modernization perspective, that modern, when society becomes modernized, religion will inevitably be marginalized and it become irrelevant. This was the mindset of many people, including, including the liberals, including the social democratic. But in Iran at that time, it was immediately we saw for Jin that religion is a powerful ideology. They do want to take over the state, and their leader has overwhelming popular uh, charismatic support. If Iranian leftists and liberals and secularists in 1979-1980 had decided that the best thing to do would be protection of civil liberties at the time, institutionalizing fundamental guarantees for freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, something we have never had in Africa. At this moment, this is what we need to do. The religious people would not have defeated us. They would not have been e able to. What did they do? They used the, the leftists against the liberals. And once they got the threat of the liberals, then they went through the leftists. They used one against the other. Divide and, and conquer. And Khomeini's, he was very open and unambiguous about his strategy. And it's really tragic that the collectivity of the progressive forces in Iran failed to recognize this. So what would be your suggestions about this anti-imperialist movement to do here? I think the anti-imperialist movement is really a relic of the past, and it is on its way out. You don't find them you know, as a teacher. I have taught in the United States for 42 years. I don't see them on campuses anymore, and I do lecture extensively. They are really older people or very exceptional individuals. With the best, they are actually progressive. They have good intentions, no question about that. But just as the dogma, when it enters your mind, it takes over your mindset and your rationality, like religious dogma. It, uh, so they are faced with nothing, there is nothing, because they are not really dealing with logic. We should ask them, as I have sometimes, particularly in New York, like the Bay Area, you find these people. You said, listen, look at Iran. What about the Iranian workers? What about Iranian women? What about civil liberties in Iran? What about fun? In, the Iranian woman has no problem with capitalism. The distribution of wealth and income in Iran is more skewed today than it was under the Shah. Poverty in Iran is more extensive today than it was under homelessness. Today, we read that inflation in Iran is 31%, official record. So what is happening to, in other words, the suffering of the Iranian or the Korean or the Syrian people at the present time is nothing, because at some point in the distant history, 200 years, 100 years, 500 years, you know, the heaven will be created on earth and everybody. This is an absurdity. Even they didn't learn from Mao. In Mao, in China, they came to the realization this is an absurd idea. Let's move on <laughs> to production of wealth and income. And China has gone through a sea change. Of it. it's, I remember right here in California, many of our Iranian friends, you're too young probably to remember. Every time you argue with them, they take Bauer's Red Book out of their pocket and they could. I, I was there. No one. <laughs> you know, it's not that when you talk about, you know, religious absurdities and dogma, they take out the Quran and say, which page they read. And Mao Zedong, like Khomeini, like Lenin, said so many things that anybody can quote them to support anything. I have that little red book in my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you I know, don't, it's, it irritates me and it's, it saddens me when I face that. But I don't see them as, an, as a significant uh, force at all. They're a dying force. Thank you again. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, you don't know, it's tremendous, uh, 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 emotionally very liberating for me right now and what I'm hearing from Thank you. Thank you so, so much. You're very so, kind. So I, but your comments, you know, you just created a lot of enemies for yourself. Uh, uh, when? 
<laughs> about <laughs> right now about the anti-imperialist movement here? I don't think so. I don't think so. They're virtually highly marginal and irrelevant. You know, I was in Berkeley last week, Wednesday, debating. I don't know if you know, you know the Leverets. The Flint and Hillary Leverets have written a book called Going to Iran that they have received a great deal of publicity. I was debating them in, in the KPFK in San Francisco. It was a fundraising event for KPFK at a church. KPFA. KPFA uh, in, uh, in uh, College uh, Avenue or College Street in, in Berkeley. KPFA has some of those listeners, but not a single one of them, because that's exactly what it's ironic that the, people, these, the couple who have written this book, they, were, they have CIA background and they have also with the foreign policy analysts and members of the security, national security team of the Bush administration. Now they have switched completely and they have presented a very utopian, platonic picture of Iran mm -hmm. and urging the United States to recognize and cooperate with Iran and they want Obama to go to Iran the same way Richard Nixon went to, <laughs> to Peking. So I was going to argue with them, I was e expecting some people, the dogmatic old leftists who think there are only two camps <laughs> in the world and we have to choose. They didn't raise any question at all, I don't see them anymore. Periodically, you run into them in major cities like Los Angeles, New York, or San Francisco, and all that. But I think there is overwhelming evidence in the world to uh, completely demolish their philosophical orientation and their suggestions for political activism. So, where do we go f from here between Iran and U.S.? What would be your pragmatical, underground solution to this? Uh, bickering, fighting, I hate you, you hate me. I don't think it, the, it's, I think Iranian regime will, in, within itself, will come to a, to a dead end, will come, will run against the wall because their policies, even though in the short run they are serving the interests of various groups and individuals in the country, but they are not sustainable. They are not sustainable economically and politically. They are not sustainable. We have to, the, the regime will come to its own internal conflicts and contradictions. And, but the first generation of leaders, I'm not at all optimistic that Khamenei and Rafsanjani and Jannati and the rest will change. But it may well be that the following generation, maybe we have to wait 10 years or 15 years because they're all on the way out. They are all in their 70s, you know. Uh, it, they, will, they could switch, but not the present you know, generation. But the Iranians, I would say what we need to do, we have to focus on human rights, the culture of human rights. And we have to create organization. As I said yesterday, I hope before I, I'm cremated, I see at least one Iranian group which is based on dues-paying democratic governance and professional administrators, we haven't done that yet, which is unbelievable. We have been active outside the country for over 50 years, and we have not been able to create an organization that is inclusive, that reject, respects pluralism. Democracy, the principle, preconception of democracy, which has been around for a couple hundred years, evolving, is one undeniable fact that Human beings, regardless of where they are in the modern world, have conflicts. They have conflicts of interest. They have conflicts of beliefs. They have conflicts of values. They have clash of egos. Wherever they are, they're in Americans, in Sweden. So what do we deal with this reality? What are the rules of the game for competition? Anybody who says, I know how to end conflict, as the leftists do, you know, economic economic materialism, that is, or the religious people, they know they have revealed to them from God and all. They are despotic characters in reality. I mean, there's overwhelming evidence, regardless of what language they use. So Iranians have come to realize 
that pluralism is an inevitability. Culturally, many of us, within the same family, there's somebody who prays and somebody who hates it, <laughs> and we live together. That's, this will not change for the foreseeable future. So we need people who are interested in political activism outside the country. The best thing we can do is to promote the culture of human rights, not only in, in words, but in action. We are, very, we are well versed. When it comes to understanding of democracy, Iranians are wonderful. But when it comes to acting and behaving, we are primitive. So the liberals and the leftists devote a great deal of their time denouncing each other, accusing each other of bad faith, and movement toward pluralism. That is, recognizing this. When I say in any society, in any modern society, that individualism becomes important, we know the knowledge and science that these conflicts are just inevitable. Show me one country ever in human history where these conflicts didn't exist. But democratic societies are the ones that have found the methods of decision making that resolves specific conflicts, not putting an end to the idea of conflict. And a lot of times the decisions displease one faction or the other. But the procedures allow them to continue their... That is the nature of of the, we have yet to come to a practical behavior recognition of this reality. Not only in Iran, in, in Egypt, they're going through this agony. And, or in Syria, the opposition. The only country in the Middle East, there are two countries in the Middle East that have recognized it. One is Israel, the other one is Turkey. That they have accepted pluralism that, listen, this country, nobody has the key to unlock <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the dead end nature of, of this, this conflict. What, what do we do with this? This is an important turning point in the advancement of human consciousness in societies where we have never had democratic experience. So thank you very much again. Last question, and that's, uh, you spoke of uh, last night, and you did it right now, that you relying on youth, younger generation, to change things. And, and um, anything that I haven't asked you, if you could l talk about what are your hopes and aspirations uh, for the future? First of all, with respect to the objective conditions that make me uh, be optimistic about the youth, and also I read as much as possible, but, but people write, people who are in Iran, or the young people who... One is that that utopian thinking, that Madini Fazile, that perfect country that through the left and through the Islam was propagated at this for the next two, they're both dead. Yeah. That so people have become more realistic, that listen, whatever solutions we find to our problems which has to come from our own society and the result of our own you know, effort. Nobody has a formula sitting in Peking or Moscow. To, it's, there is no Einstein in politics <laughs> that we really have to search within the possible. That recognition is very widespread, not only in Iran, but in the rest of the world. One continent where this recognition has produced very hopeful results is Latin America, no question. That uh, democratic advancement in Latin America is the result of this. The second part that makes me optimistic about it, for the first time in Iran, the only Islamic country where people came to feel the ugliness of religion becoming the ideology of the state. When religion becomes the ideology of the state, it's not only the state that becomes corrupt, but religion itself becomes immensely corrupt and absurd because they use it to justify anything, and depending on which part they read. So the fact that there is no the emphasis on native resources, emphasis on native realities, national realities, and in a kind of very painful, almost agonizing experience of living under a political order that interferes in the private sphere of life. They want to know what you do in your bedroom. They want to know what you do with your... The, in, the, going to the school, trying to uh, 
indoctrinated the children against the parents. This is the new experience in, in our country, in Iran. We have never had, even in the traditional society, the state didn't have anything to do with the private. Industry. So the results of all these things have created a generation, and today we are talking about 70% of Iranian people were born after the revolution. So they have a very different understanding of history. And this is all post-Cold War, post-Maoism, post-Stalinism, post-Islamism. You know. They're in a new world, and based on the novels published in Iran, poetry published in Iran, political tracts published in Iran, fantastic use of the internet, but there is a lot of hope that the young people are moving in a very different direction. I hope that we offer our experiences so they will not make the same mistakes as we did in our generation. I'm very optimistic about young Iranians in the way they see the world and the way they see the potential inside the country. Thank you very much, Professor. Manch. Thank you very much, my Thank pleasure. You. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.